Excited to have you all over here. Uh, my name is Naveen Bist. I'm the chair of programs uh, at High Silicon Valley. It's a volunteer organization, so I'm a volunteer here overseeing the programs. Uh, so how many of you know about Thai? Uh, oh, that's great. How many of you have come here before to the events? That's why I was getting confused, because usually our events start at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, you know. So <laughs> seems like it's still afternoon. Um, so anyway, for those who are not here, uh, I can just give you a couple of minute brief intro, and then after that I'm going to introduce MP Divakar, who is uh, from IEEE ComSec Society, uh, with whom we have partnered and uh, put together this great event. So Thai Silicon Valley, um, basically Thai organization is about fostering entrepreneurship. It was founded in 1992 uh, with um, a small group of entrepreneurs who came from South Asian region and who had been widely successful here and to uh, give back to the society. So from that, from 1992 onwards, uh, the organization has grown, it's like grassroots organization, grown in, across 18 countries and there are over 60 chapters now, all the way um, in Europe, uh, UK, Germany, Scandinavia, in Stockholm, then in Asia and down under in Australia to Malaysia, Singapore, Japan and India and uh, also in Pakistan, as well as in North America in major cities in Canada and uh, US. So, and, and the mission has always been fostering entrepreneurship. So what we do is uh, all the activities around fostering entrepreneurship, which is having programs. So we have programs like these, where we have partners like IEEE ComSec Society, where we hold these panels and events, uh, which, is, uh, which kind of gives you a, a good insight into the market, what's happening. And then we have specific programs we, we decide, uh, which like we have Big Data, Mobile, uh, Life Sciences, and um, uh, Software Defined Infrastructure. And then uh, some programs which are on inspiring uh, entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs. So like we have, uh, we had a session called My Story. It's a monthly program. Last week we had Martin Casado, founder of Nisera, those who are in network infrastructure, bought by VMware. So he shared his um, entrepreneurial journey and then uh, we have one actually upcoming on um, uh, October 1st, first Tuesday of every month we have this founder of a company called Yumi Networks which is in uh, digital advertising area, he's, they just went public so they come, he's, he'll be coming and speaking here um, and similarly other programs. Then in addition we have two other main programs uh, we have here are Thai Angels, so any aspiring entrepreneurs in the audience? or any entrepreneurs who are looking for money? Anyone looking for money? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, you can go to thaisp.org and you can apply for seed uh, funding. It's about anywhere up to half to one million. They've funded over 18 to 20 companies, actually 22 over the last two and a half years since it was founded. And then we have another program, as you see a lot of cubes there, which we are just launching, Thai Launchpad, uh, which will be focused on enterprise, I think enterprise software area mainly and where you know, company which is selected will run like a six month boot camp plus they get some seed money to do. So those of you, or if you know any friends or anyone, they can definitely apply over there. So with that, um, and in terms of the membership is open to everyone, uh, you know, you can become a member for just like, I think it's about, what, 50 cents a day? <laughs> $150 a year, I guess that's what it'll come out to, right? 50 cents. <laughs> then you get nice food, I don't, I don't know what to do, whether I triply paid for it, but I'll let me talk about it. But usually from Thai, you'll get nice food and you get glasses of wine also there, but today there's no alcohol, as I see. So anyway, so you can become a member and you can just get all that money back within three times you show up here and eat a lot of food and drink wine. So, and plus you get a lot of insight if you don't. So uh, please make sure those who are not members uh, become a Thai member and support the cause of fostering entrepreneurship. And then uh, we have other two constituencies, or charter members, where we have about 300 of them in Silicon Valley who are highly successful entrepreneurs and executives. And then we have a number of sponsors, like you know all the large companies, VC firms, um, you know law firms, who basically the, uh, the, the all these uh, the ecosystem of entrepreneurship, you know those who support that, so they are, uh, they help us. So with that, what I would like to do is I would like to thank uh, these four, uh, four um, individuals from IEEE Comp Sex. Uh, society. One is Samir Harlelkar, 
and MP, he's going to come and talk about anyway from the IEEE side. Saurabh, I guess he's somewhere he's hiding. Back, 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 back. There is Saurabh. And then Sanjay Kasturiya. I don't know where Sanjay is. Not here today. So anyway, let's give them a big round of applause to the IEEE. Then on the uh, high side, and you know, I have to put Terry right over there. He's been the light behind the whole Thai team to help with these folks. Let's give him a big special round of applause. Then other folks over there are uh, Raj Desai, of course, our Thai executive director. I think he's back there in the office. And Raj Singh was another uh, volunteer for Thai. So we have been really instrumental in making it happen. I've seen so many emails the last six months. Just, uh, I really appreciate and uh, thanks a lot for putting this joint event together. With that, what I would like to do is invite MP Diwakar to talk about from the IEEE. Thank you, MP. Thank you, Navin. Um, on behalf of IEEE Communication Society, uh, welcome. Um, happy that you're all here. Um, we've had a long, productive uh, relationship with Thai. Uh, I don't know how many of you attended uh, the professor's panel uh, I think it was last year, the year before, where we discussed transferring you know, academic knowledge into industry. Uh, that was a very well received and reported, incidentally, uh, good event. Um, Communication Society of Santa Clara Valley, uh, Silicon Valley in short, is the most active chapter in the entire North American continent. So we, this year we have had the distinction of getting two awards the best in the Silicon Valley, and also the best in the West, Region 6. Uh, our membership fee is very similar to that of uh, time. It doesn't cost less than 50 cents a day. By all means, you know, stop by. Um, we have a very lively, active chapter in this area. So last week, we had an excellent program by Google about the balloon project called Google Loon, and that program was house full. Um, most of our slides are on our website. If you Google Comstock SCV, SCV for short, Santa Clara Valley, you'll find all the previous presentations of slides. Um, with this, uh, let me also acknowledge you know, the great uh, cooperation and help that Ty has given to us. Uh, Terry has been invaluable, Harini back there, and Raj, both Raj Desai and Raj Singh have been uh, relentless in helping us responding the next second whenever an email hits their inbox. Uh, Naveen has been a good guiding force uh, in getting speakers and setting the program. Uh, my IEEE uh, colleagues, Samir Harlekar, uh, back there, Saurav, uh, thanks to you all. So the program uh, is in two sessions. Uh, these are separated by a dinner break. The first session will have a keynote and then three speakers. Uh, the keynote, will be by Dr. Rachel Kalma. So I'll give a short uh, intro on her, and, but let me also go through the logistics and the house rules. Um, please, first off, please turn off, if you have any ringing mobiles, please put them into vibrate mode. Uh, questions, you know, we have an exclusive you know, Q&A panel. You can ask, ask all the questions you want. During the presentation, if you have a short question or a clarification, feel free to raise your hand and ask it. Otherwise, let the presenter you know, go through their material. Um, with that, uh, let me just say a word or two about Rachel's background. Uh, she's, I think she's one of the distinctive members in today's program because she has a neuroscience background. And she's working very much in you know, you know, neighborhood of technology. So that makes a very interesting you know, combination. So I'm curious to ask a bunch of questions related to both. Uh, she's a graduate of Stanford University with a PhD in neuroscience, as I just mentioned. Uh, she is the data scientist uh, currently at Miss Wit Wearables. Um, she runs also a very vibrant meetup group. It's called Sensor. So feel free to look that up in the meetup groups and join and participate. She also has the distinction of being an alumni of uh, d -Dart School, Singularity University, and the Rock Health. Uh, with that, uh, let me in my to the Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you guys for inviting me. I just wanted to point out that censored, the meetup group is with an S, very important. It changes the meaning. Uh, so, 
I'm Rachel. I'm a data scientist at Misfit Wearables. Misfit makes elegant wearable technology. And our first product is a Shine, which is an activity tracker. And so when I joined Misfit, I was excited to have the opportunity to try out all of the tracking devices. And so I started wearing all of these saying, OK, well, I'm curious to compare the data and see which ones are good for which things and what strategies they use to drive user engagement. And I was hoping that this is maybe like half a year down the line, that I would be able to tell you a story about how by tracking what I was doing every day, I was able to learn a little bit about myself and my habits and optimize things and tweak them so that I could be more active and integrate into my routine and have this great story about self-learning. But that's not what I learned. What I learned is that I can't get my data. I have, from the 10 devices that I started wearing last December, I had 10 different logins for 10 different websites and apps. And all of the data lived in its own little place. And some of them, some, some of the devices let you download your data, the, the daily totals. Some it's free, some for a price. Some have APIs, but most don't. And that makes it really hard to get your data. And so you might be thinking, OK, clearly she's crazy. She has way more sensor devices. But do most people really want a CSV file of like minute by minute step count? And I say that you're probably correct. Most people don't. But what we do want is interoperability. I want these devices to connect to my other devices. If I haven't walked enough, I want my Fitbit to tell my <laughs> Internet, okay, you need to get really slow now so that Rachel goes outside and walks around because that matters to me. Or if I was uh, wearing a cardiac patch, I would want it to be able to communicate to my doctor that I was having an issue and not in, in real time and not have to be something that happens weeks later. So we do care about interoperability. And uh, when I started looking into it, like why is it that I can't get my data? I realize that it's actually pretty complex. And I'm going to talk about some of those challenges, but first I'm going to take a step back and give you a little bit of a broader picture. Now you guys all know about Moore's Law and that connected devices are getting smaller and cheaper and more ubiquitous. And this is enabling a connected future where I can talk to my devices, they can talk to each other, and it's changing the way that we think about healthcare, about manufacturing, about government, about science, about business, about all of the industries that we can think of are changing because of these connected sensor devices. Now, this is allowing us to have these great visions of the future where we have things like Wi-Fi toasters that print the weather on our toast, or autonomous vehicles that allow us to drive without sitting in traffic, or a little bit further down the line, smart medicines that can figure out um, what's going wrong in your body before you even have any symptoms and fix it. And so we have this vision of this future where we have this explosion of sensor devices giving us data from the personal level to the global level. And this is what's feeding this grand vision of this Internet of Things, which is awesome, except that's not where we're going. This great vision of this world we're going to enter that's going to take us beyond where we went with smartphones, that's not where we're heading because we can't actually get the data from these devices and they can't talk to each other. Instead, we're going to end up with the Apple Internet of Things, and the Google Internet of Things, and the Why Things Internet of Things, and the Fitbit Internet of Things, and that's not really what we want. So why is this? I'm going to talk about seven technical challenges for connected devices that feed into this problem of making it hard to get data. Now, the first challenge is a lack of common infrastructure. Now, in the Internet of Things, we have this new economy, and the currency of our devices in this economy is data. But we're pioneers here, and we don't really have the infrastructure set up. And so, just like with money, if you don't have the same currency, it makes commerce really hard. So like money, data by itself is useless. You need to be able to apply it. So we need this infrastructure. And that's something that we need to be able to address. I apologize. I just realized that um, part of my slides are cut off. But basically, 
without the right infrastructure, this data doesn't do anything. Data doesn't solve problems by itself, it just sits there. So uh, that's one of the challenges. The second challenge is about who should have access and control of data. Now, people often talk about ownership, data ownership. Now, that doesn't necessarily make sense for things that aren't tangible. Now, if I have a physical record and I give it to my friend Chien, then my friend Chien has my record. Now, my friend Mega sends me a song that she wrote as an MP3 <coughs> file. I can take a copy of it and send it to Chien, and then we both have it. And so, if you're talking about digital goods, ownership isn't necessarily the right model because who owns the file? Well, we both have it, so we both own it. And the more relevant conversation should be one of control. Who should get to control this, uh, this file? And so just as Creative Commons is used by artists and musicians and anybody who makes digital media to say, hey, we know it's online, we know it's available, you're going to be able to get it, but here's what we'd like, how we'd like for you to treat it. Maybe that's the kind of conversation we should be having about data. Now, let's say that you've built this really complex machine and somebody presses a button on it and it does something. Okay, well, who should get that data? You built the machine, but you're the one who pressed the button and so it wouldn't have happened without you, but it wouldn't have happened without this machine either. And so uh, the data is generated by both. And why is this hard? Well, uh, some of you might be familiar with the example of the story of Hugo Campos. And Hugo Campos has a Medtronic implantable defibrillator, and he, for many, many years, couldn't get access to his data. He just finally got it last summer. And so on one hand, we as patients, it seems obvious that we should have access to our data. It's coming from our bodies. But on the other hand, it's complex. Like you've built this medical device. If I give you your data and you don't know how to interpret it correctly and you make a bad medical decision, is that the company's fault? Is that your fault? Who's, who's liable? Or let's say that uh, you download it on your computer and it somehow gets corrupted. Somebody may have hacked in or maybe just the file um, got munged, then you could also make a bad decision. And then it's really kind of hard to decide what should happen. And so there, there are a lot of really complex issues here. And I'm not advocating that we shouldn't give people their data or that we should. All I'm saying is that there's a lot to think about. And there are many, many people thinking about this right now. What is uh, what should be the policies and about liability and security and privacy with respect to data. And we're going to be in a very different place, like two to three years down the line. So we need to start thinking about these policies right now. The third challenge is about standards. We have a Tower of Babel here in the wild west of the Internet of Things where our devices aren't even speaking the same language. Now, even though we're generating all of this data, we can't necessarily compare it across our devices. Now let's take my example. All of my devices count steps. Now, what is a step? Is a Fitbit step the same as a Jawbone Up step? Is that the same as a Misfit Shine step? And steps are only a part of what we do. So if you try to convert other things into steps, is if you try to say count swimming is backstroke, how many steps is that? Is that the same as butterfly? And what about things like growing or yoga? Those are uh, really hard to count in terms of steps. And all of these companies acknowledge that. And so they all have different ways of filling in the gaps to give you a more complete picture of what your activity was. So like Nike has Nike Fuel, and uh, Fitbit has an activity score. Shine has activity points as well. And so those do allow you to do a much better job of figuring out, okay, how active was I? But what they don't do is allow you to compare across them because they're totally different and there's no conversion factor. And so maybe you're thinking, okay, fine, this is, sounds like the early days of the internet. Maybe we should just have some standards. But one challenge is that we don't yet know what we're building, and so if we impose standards too early, it's going to limit the amount of 
or the, the kinds of things that we can do. And so we want, on one hand, to be able to share data and access other devices, but on the other hand, we don't yet know the right questions to ask. And so it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. And so um, the answer to this challenge is still not clear. We don't know what standards we should have. But in the meantime, what we can do is be very clear about documentation and about giving APIs so that we can access each other's data and we can tell each other, hey, this is how you should use the data from my device. And will we as a field try to figure out what is this kind of data good for? Uh, another challenge is data sharing. Now if the goal it, for our devices is to interact with other devices, we want to be able to share data. But the challenge is that if you're a company that's built a device so that you can get data, then you go through a lot of effort to build the device, to go through manufacturing, to break the firmware, to optimize battery life, and then when you finally have the data, if you just give it away, you're essentially commoditizing yourself. And so the question is, how do you, as a company, do right by your users by giving them access to their data while still being competitive as a company? And so there are a number of different approaches that people are taking from being completely open, which is great for building communities, it's great for interoperability, maybe a little bit less clear about how to generate revenue doing that. Um, to the other end of the spectrum, totally closed, you can optimize, you can have great battery life, you're not gonna have anybody interacting with your device though. And so there's a whole range of solutions that people are exploring and the jury's still out about the right one, but it's definitely something that we need to explore as a community too. The next challenge is accuracy. People often ask, which one is the, the, the most accurate? The answer is, it doesn't matter. Like, none of these, the goal of these devices is to track how active you are and give you kind of a relative measure and inspire you to be more active. But if you really cared about accuracy, you should go buy a $400 GPS watch. Like, it costs four times as much as these, and the battery certainly doesn't last four months, but it's going to give you much more accurate data. So you need to decide how accurate does my device need to be for the kinds of questions I want to answer and what, how, do, how do I want people to use this device? And so um, accuracy is a challenge because you can't have everything. And part of the reason for that is battery life. Battery life is the Achilles heel of wearables. Everything is a trade-off with battery life, whether it's the sampling rate at which you're processing the data storing it or how often you can communicate with the phone, what kind of algorithms you can run, how many sensors you can connect, all of these come down to battery life. So in order to make real changes in this area, we need alternatives for powering our devices. There's some optimization that we can do with current battery technology, but new technologies um, are going to allow us to be in a completely different ballpark. Next challenge is interface. So how you use and wear your product is going to determine how people interact with it, whether it's something you wear on your face or you wear on your wrist or it's in your car. And the real goal is to be able to figure out how am I going to provide value to the person wearing my device or using my device? And then I want to get out of the way. Like, the goal for these technologies shouldn't be to be a burdensome thing that people have to pay attention to all the time, but to help you do it, what you're trying to do anyway, and then to slide into the background. So those are some of the challenges that we face with these wearables. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the technologies that we have available today and some potential steps of where we might be headed. So I'm going to come back to another question. Why do we collect health data? So for somebody like my dad, he collects his blood glucose levels for disease management. There are many other reasons why you might collect health data from training for an athletic event to helping you sleep better, you want to lose weight, or any number of different things. And the quantified self-movement is all about this. It's about 
uh, tracking things, to ask questions about ourselves quantitatively. And um, can you raise your hands if you've heard of quantified self before? Okay, so most of you. So it's a global movement that's been picking up a lot of momentum and it's all about, it, it's not about the technology, it's about what can we learn by tracking things. And so these devices are a way to do that. If you go to the Quantified Self website, there's a guide to over 500 different uh, devices and apps. So this is tracking on a very personal level. We also have tracking on a global level using Google, Google Flu Trends. Um, allows you to predict outbreaks of uh, the flu all over the world, even before the, the CDC. And so using geolocated sensors, you can take that even a step further. So Ushahidi uh, makes crowdsourced maps where people can put things on maps like uh, people taking bribes or corruption or all sorts of different things. And they've started integrating geolocated sensors into their crowdsourced maps. So now their crowdsourcing is taking uh, input from humans, but it's also crowdsourcing sensor data and mashing them up so that you can use that for things like looking at flooding, where you want some quantitative sensor data from, say, water levels, but people can also report uh, where they've seen things happening. A uh, company called Asmopolis does something like this for help. So they have GPS um, asthma inhalers, and so they can track where and when people uh, use their inhalers so that they can warn people, hey, today is going to be a, a, uh, like a poor air quality day, and you can start to learn things not only about yourself, but from other people in your community. Uh, Ginger.io uses just the sensors from your phone. There's a lot that you can learn about your own behavioral patterns that can tell you a lot about your health. And there are other people adding even more sensors to your phone. There are all sorts of Kickstarter campaigns and Indiegogo campaigns where people are building things that connect via BLE, Bluetooth, low energy usually now, uh, to allow you to expand the capability of what you can do with your phone. There are also an increasing number of open source sensors, which is really cool because it allows you to say, hey, none of these devices are going to give me my raw data, but if I use something like the Arduino Pulse sensor, I can stream raw data. Yeah, I have to wear an Arduino <laughs> battery pack and write some code, but it allows you to play with a lot more things. And so that kind of thing is what's giving rise to this huge maker and hardware movement um, where it's becoming easier and easier to build your own sensor devices and with the rise of crowdfunding like Indiegogo and Kickstarter you can actually turn your your projects into products and it's not just in the physical world that there are so many meetups and community groups that gather all over the world to help each other out, to collaborate, to talk about ideas in this space. And so these are the kinds of things that we have now, and they're really <coughs> cool. But the next wave of sensors is even more exciting. So the next wave of sensors is increasingly wearable, both aesthetically and uh, imperceptibly. And it has things like passive analytics engines that are computing things, say, about your bloodstream, to is standard intelligence, um, without you even having to think about it. And things like lab on a chip are allowing you to turn your smartphone into a mobile clinic. And all of these technologies are moving things like the Star Trek medical tricorder from science fiction to science. And companies like Scanadu and Cellscope are leveraging that building on uh, your smartphone. There are also other kinds of technologies that are feeding into this and allowing us to do even more things like IBM Watson, uh, which is now in medical school. And so basically this is taking heavy duty computing and artificial intelligence and bringing it to say, physicians as clinical, uh, clinical decision support systems. So it's not replacing doctors, but it's augmenting what they can do. 
Other technologies like genomic sequencing are becoming increasingly cheaper, allowing you to do things like get your own genome sequenced from 23andMe, but increasingly will play a role in um, your, in figuring out the, the right drugs to target and which ones are going to be most effective for you. So making medicine more personal. There's also the frontier of the microbiome. So we have 10 times more um, microorganisms in our bodies than human cells. And we know very little about them. And we're just starting to scratch the surface now. And this could have a really big impact on the way that we think about behavior and cognition and disease. So <coughs> what do these technologies mean for healthcare? Are they going to replace our doctors? And the answer is no. We're still going to go to our doctors, but they're going to help fill in some gaps. So I like to think of it as um, going to your doctor is like going to the studio to take a studio portrait. It's a very high quality picture, but it doesn't tell you what's happening from say, portrait to portrait. So if you go every year, you don't know what happens in between. And so as it's become easier to take pictures in between studio portraits, like maybe in the 1800s, you, you certainly didn't have Instagram, but as people could take more and more pictures, you get a, a, a more complete view of what your life looked like. So, these digital health devices are going to help tell more of a complete story. Another way to think of it is about uh, in, in the context of weight. So if the only time that you could weigh yourself was when you went to the doctor, then it would be really hard to correct your course if you were gaining too much weight or losing too much weight. But if you can measure yourself every day, then you can see local trends and you can change them before they become problematic. And so people have scales in their house and this works well for weight, but we're starting to get access to all sorts of other signals that we've never had access to before, which is going to give us a much more rapid turnaround cycle to be able to change things before they become problems. Now looking a little bit further into the future, we're going to have technologies like OnStar, but not for your car, but for your body. And this will give you, say, a check engine light if there's something that you need to investigate. So getting alerts is good. What's even better is closing feedback loops. So using navigation assistance like Waze, which can automatically navigate you and route you depending on what roadblocks are there. Um, maybe not driving down 101 at 3.30 p.m. There might be traffic everywhere. But basically, these kinds of tools, we want navigation assistance for help. And this is where we're heading. So being able to close the feedback loop rather than just say, hey, you should look into your blood pressure, being able to fix it sometimes passively without you even knowing anything. So there's some really exciting opportunities a little bit further down the road. Now, we had this explosion of sensor devices. We have all of these challenges, but it's a really exciting time to be in this space. I'm confident that our communities are going to be able to figure out how to overcome a lot of the challenges that I was talking about. And that's going to allow us to take in these multiple streams of sensor data simultaneously and to choreograph our devices to be able to augment our lives in the ways that I've talked about, in ways that we haven't even yet begun to imagine. Thanks. I'm not sure if I'm taking questions now or later. Um, one are the short ones. Okay. Uh, it's a good talk. What kind of a time frame you are talking about these things to become real for a real person? Sure. So most of the things I talked about are real or maybe not on the market now, but are being tested and exist. Things like uh, feed closed loop feedback systems. Probably we want to validate that what we can measure is really good, but things like alert systems, those, uh, 
Those are things that we can do now. The regulatory framework here in the US means that it probably won't be an app that you download onto your smartphone right now, but there, there are definitely things that you can build for yourself. Like I built a, a, I used the Arduino pulse sensor, I hooked it up to my ear, it talked over Bluetooth to my phone and sent me a text message if my heart rate went above a certain rate. These are things we can do right now. The hardest part for me is that we can't get access to this data and it's not because companies are greedy and don't want to give it away, but there are some real uh, challenges in terms of business models and in terms of battery life. And so being able to correlate multiple streams of data is going to really open up a lot of doors. So very back. nice talk, thank you very much. I just had a quick question. You, know, you, you, you were rolling down your seven challenges in the beginning. I was hoping you'd touch upon one of the topics that's of interest for a lot of people, privacy and security. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's going to be a, a pretty important thing for people to make sure that their data is used in the way that they intend to be used. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it is a huge issue. And I view that as not something that's opposite to openness, but complementary. Like, if we want to be able to make the data available to the right people, and we also need to think seriously about how much data should you share, how can you opt in, what does it mean for, say, a doctor to have your data? Is the doctor liable if they don't look at all of your Fitbit data from the last three years and find that there was some trend? Like, we need, we absolutely need better policies, and that was what I was talking about also in the, the context of Hugo Campos. Like, if I get my medical data and I misinterpret it, that's a challenge. But I agree, privacy and security are huge, huge issues as well. So, <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I see what you're saying. You're, you're actually creating new measurements, but really, how do you even make a decision based on the measurement? Was there actually medical research? Dani, could you say that, you know, given the stream of so many different signals? Sorry, could you repeat the What question? I meant is, uh, mm -hmm. how can a doctor make a decision if you present him like sure. five streams of data? Yeah. Was there even research done with this kind of data before? No, I mean, we haven't had access to that kind of right. data before. And I don't think that it should be a doctor's responsibility to do that. I think that, uh, it, especially in the U.S., that the model for medicine doesn't allow for doctors to sit and do data analysis at night. Um, but what we as a community and we as a field can do is people that are data scientists like me, I would love to get this data. I know how to do experiments and I would love to start validating, hey, how good is this? And I would love to do studies with hospitals, with clinics. I mean, so one, one challenge I also see is that there are many people uh, building health devices. and. Most of these people, or m many of the people building these are also interested in medical problems. And then there are all these medical issues where we know what the questions are, but we don't really have the, the right tools. And there's this chasm in between. And we're starting to tiptoe towards the middle, but the, we still have a ways to go. But the thing that's really cool about the consumer devices is that we can test things rapidly and uh, when we, we can also use them in the context of clinical trials and then at some point they may get to a point where we can say hey run this script inside your uh, electronic medical record and take this data and send an alert but we're not going to be there quite yet yeah. one last just to follow up this question, you know, there was a uh, article in the uh, New York Times recently just questioning the value of measuring all this stuff, mm -hmm. and, and really as it pertains to helping people lose weight, which is what a lot of people want to do. Mm -hmm. And basically, I think the point of the article was, well, there's no real evidence that it helps people actually lose weight. Sure. So is there, are, is there actually evidence about that? I mean, I think, it, so what there is evidence is about is that anything that you measure, you tend to improve. So even just the act, and there are studies showing even just the act of stepping on a scale every day helps people lose weight. 
And so these devices are not going to help you lose weight unless you have something else that you're doing. Like just knowing the number of steps I take every day doesn't do anything to make me more active. And so I think that that is a huge challenge for all of these devices is, okay, we can count steps, great. Who cares about steps? I don't care about steps and I'm a data scientist. Like it's nice to have data about myself, but what really matters is whether you have a question that you're trying to ask about yourself that data can help answer. And if you do, awesome, these are great tools. If you don't, they're not magic. They're just giving you a number every day. Some of them are starting to use different strategies. Like I know a lot of people that on their fuel band would run around the block a couple times before midnight. Other people, like I, I like the social features on the Jawbone Up. I can see how active my friends are. We're starting to move in directions of, that engage people as well. But I, I totally agree that just wearing a device alone won't help you lose weight unless you have, it's part of a bigger picture. And there, there are also uh, definitely studies going on at, at various hospitals and clinics and um, lo looking at how you can integrate these into uh, bigger picture strategies for health. Thank you. Thank you. I hope everyone hope you have a great day. I will be around for the you know, panel for my Q&A so we can bring up more questions, especially on the topics like you know, security, privacy, and a bunch of questions for the panel. Okay, next, uh, I want to bring on stage uh, George Chapman. Uh, he's the CTO of DigiFit. Uh, he's got more than 27 years of experience in managing software development. Uh, prior to DigiFit, he was at Blue J2 Global in Santa Barbara. So he's been kind enough to drive up the coast uh, on his own time and you know, uh, be great, gracious enough to uh, come here and present. So here is Josh Chong. I'm George Chapman, the CTO of DigiFit. Um, great talk, Rachel. Uh, one of their slides showed the quantified self, and I noticed that DigiFit. Um, um, so one of the um, one of the companies listed on the quantified self was DigiFit, um, and I thought I would spend today just talking about a little bit about our journey to give some insight and wisdom as to uh, where we came from, and I think it bears on some of the topics uh, that Rachel raised up. Um, in 2005, uh, our founder walked into um, his doctor's office and had, um, was told that he had to go on uh, $20,000 worth of uh, meds each year. Um, he had high blood pressure, he um, was overweight, a type A personality that just really um, delighted with life but didn't necessarily have the um, best habits. But uh, he, um, uh, let's see, he was um, determined not to go on meds. And so what he did was embarked on a journey, which I'll um, uh, call Self Help 1.0, uh, where he uh, Measured his weight every day. Um, he, excuse me, I'm nervous. Get this. Um, he measured his weight. He researched and found that um, if he can measure his heart rate while training, there's a lot your heart can tell you about your uh, fitness level. Um, he tracked his nutrition, and over the course of uh, six months, he went back to the doctor's office and um, didn't have to go on meds. So that bore DigiFit. And what he did was founded a company that um, took what he learned through spreadsheets um, and built uh, mobile devices that was able to collect all of this different data from wireless weight scales and blood pressure cuffs and activity monitors. Uh, speed and cadence sensors, uh, BLE, B, uh, Bluetooth, and plus, to create a dashboard that would help him understand 
uh, his activity over time that would be able to tell him, well, if he did this much activity, say with an activity monitor, uh, worked out either running or spinning or biking um, during the course of the day, that he could track his caloric burn and actually monitor and, and see his weight change over a course of time. So a digit that came during this period was what I would call a digital self-help uh, 1.0, was a collection of apps and a corresponding uh, website would help you visualize this disparate data that uh, is collected. <coughs> in order to address some of the issues that Rachel raised with like Fitbit steps or Bobby Media steps, we certainly did a degree of normalization because after all, a step is a step and whether yours is a little bit further than mine or whether we're a little bit off really doesn't make a whole bunch of difference. But the fact that you um, are moving or not makes a bigger difference. So this is our actual, I think this is our, um, the, the director of marketing's chart over the last uh, six months where he embarked on a program to try to lose weight as well. But it shows definitely the tools to help visualize the data that you're collecting uh, seamlessly can help you manage your data and do something about it. So what did we learn? Well, um, it's hard to find a business with mobile apps. Um, there just is not a lot of money in it. People are expecting to pay $5 for an app, or even that's pretty expensive. Um, hardware sales is also a tough business to be in. Um, our founder uh, built the first um, heart rate data collection app for the iPhone, an iPhone 3, if you can believe that. And um, we built our own sensor, uh, brought in the data, and decided that uh, really it's a hard business to be in. So um, there's definitely a business there, but we chose to focus more on the software data integration platform uh, because we felt that was uh, you know, an area we can focus in and have some success. Um, the other thing is, I call this DigiFit, uh, this period, uh, self-help 1.0, because really, Michael embodies the kind of person who was our founder, who really was aggressive about collecting this data and doing something about it, but really, he's his own doctor. Um, there's a lot of people that don't fall into that category. And this, this market, although exciting for the people who like to learn about themselves, there's a lot of people who say, you know what? If I have to wear this to go for a walk, do I really want to do that? So, you know, I talked to my wife, and says, geez, I gotta wear that, put that on, I gotta worry about pairing. Uh, and so there's a, there's a friction corresponding to collecting all this data, and certainly we can build better devices that make that easier, but it's still, uh, we're getting to be, have more sensors, not less. Um, so uh, aggregating data, which I, which I just showed you, also, I would argue, is not really a solution. It's, it's helpful, uh, but it's not, it's helpful for you to interpret the data, but in of itself, I don't see that as a solution. And really, the market ultimately just want something that works. So we went to, and this is where we've been focusing the last, uh, really, year, is what I call Team 2.0. And here we introduced, now that we have this data collected from different devices, aggregating the platform, well, now we can do things like create training plans. Training plans being that coaches um, who are accustomed to in traditional uh, coaching models, I coached for a number of years so when I coached my way through graduate school, uh, these are great tools now for coaches to see into the data of their, um, of their athletes or the people they're trying to mentor uh, to intervene and, and provide feedback. Once you have this data, you can also set goals, create challenges. Uh, when you get to the corporate space, uh, especially for self-insured companies, uh, they're really uh, motivated to drive down uh, health costs. So if they can provide wellness incentives to encourage their employees to be healthy, uh, both win. Uh, if you do that, then it becomes important to have ways to measure, well, how is this really working? Your question is measuring your weight. Uh, does that really help? Uh, well, uh, when we're talking about introducing these kinds of technologies to drive down health costs, we need to assess objectively, are these things working or not? And of course, once you get into this environment, you need to be concerned about the security, uh, 
that there are similarly different barriers that are set up in the medical space. Uh, the doctor view of this data, uh, challenges there, um, and so on. But we move from a, a self-help to a team perspective, um, where it's no longer just about the individual. The employer has definite incentives to see their productive employees be healthy. It turns out that about 10 to 20 percent of the workforce uh, drive 80 percent of the cost. So if you can get just a few of those to be uh, more active, you can drive down the cost for the company, which makes them happier. Of course, if you're healthy, everyone else is healthy. This is a bit of a tough nut to crack, although there's, we are making progress. Uh, five years ago, if you went into Kaiser, uh, exercise was not really considered medicine. They now can prescribe exercise as medicine. That's a, that's a huge leap for this community. But what's causing a change is the focus on preventative care as opposed to treatment. Um, the medical community is now being incentivized <coughs> to care about preventative care. So solutions which help people be alert of their habits, whether they're not healthy and if there's things they could do to improve it, they're motivated to provide this kind of solutions, whereas before that motivation didn't necessarily exist. So we're looking at uh, enhancing the platforms that we're building to address some of these concerns. And I think that makes the uh, space more and more interesting and, and more viable from a, from a company, um, uh, certainly SARP's perspective. Um, examples, uh, if you go and do your blood tests, uh, you'll get your blood pressure, uh, cholesterol level uh, done maybe once a year. Um, what we'll do is we'll introduce things where you can do fitness assessments, which will actually measure with your heart rate over prescribed objective uh, exercises an objective measure of your fitness. And we can say, well, the employee base at this point in time overall had this kind of health score. After intervention, six months later, here's your new score. We can actually prove whether or not these things are working or not, which, which companies are going to want to know. Um, but there are still challenges here as well. Um, you need to protect employee identity, identity and information. Um, wellness investments takes time. And not all these investments are necessarily seen with the community the company invests with. You have employee turnover. How is my investment with you to do well at one company show up and, and represent itself? So you really almost need uh, a multi-company investment into a wellness for this to kind of work. Doctors are bombarded with patients showing up with health apps and saying, hey, what about my data? Uh, the data's not normalized. It's extra work. There's liability issues. So there's definitely concerns for how to cross this divide and um, that's going to take some time for our community to work that through. Um, I think that one transition from what I would call the 2.0 to going further is that motivation is kind of wellness cost driven, not necessarily user and life driven. And we need tools also for rural intervention coaches, whether it be nutritional coaches, um, fitness coaches, uh, to, to interact with this data to help provide uh, useful feedback. So I see 3.0 as more of a holistic approach, trying to provide smart content to the user in context at the right time to motivate behavioral change. Now Michael, who went to the doctor and went on this six month journey of spreadsheets and collecting data, well it turned out that his, his diet, his, his um, nutrition habits were not very good, which was attributing to his weight problem. Well, at the end of the day, if he had tools to help educate him um, for how he might change his diet, uh, become more active, uh, that might have done as good a job as being in a program of spending all this time collecting this data manually, tracking your caloric burn and weight over time. So that if you are in a position of providing smart content in context for the disease or problem you're, you're, you're pursuing uh, to try to improve at the right time, you can motivate behavioral change. And so that is one of the areas that we are focusing on. We're trying to create um, a robust technology platform that really um, supports engaging experiential solutions. Um, our CEO of the last two years was the um, person who built the first mouse for Steve Jobs. Um, and so he's all about experience. Um, so we're moving away from more of a self-help tool set 
where we collect and aggregate data and let the user make sense out of it, to really integrating content from experts out there in particular disease states, taking that content, making it available to these apps that people use to go along with their life, whether it be exercise um, or whatever they're doing, but, but to help them basically create engagements for developing healthy habits. We want to have people um, baby step their way through what we call rituals that would help them learn healthy habits so it becomes a habit. One example was um, uh, my CEO was saying how he drinks coffee in the morning and the coffee is an appetite suppressant. So he would not eat until, by himself, eat until about noon. And we was wondering why, why is he, you know, uh, why is he dragged down in the middle of the day? Well, it turns out that because coffee is a suppressant, and if you don't eat in the morning, it's not going to be that great. So he made a habit um, every day for the next 30 days, he tracked eating a granola bar before his first cup of coffee. Well, over 30 days of tracking that, he no longer needed to track it, it became a habit. So our approach is to do, to look at these small behavioral changes, provide tools to help you turn that into a ritual that can be converted to a habit, and to have um, content invite those habits in context to whatever problem um, our users are having. Um, lastly, if you really want to change health, who should you reach? And one of the conclusions we have, you should reach the moms. These are really your, you know, if your kids, if the kids are having problems, who do they go to? If there's nutrition in the family, who sets up the, the meal plans? It's the moms. If you want to reach and change health, get to the head of the family. So we have partnered with, it's one of the strategies we've adopted, is to partner with Moms in Motion, which is a national organization. Uh, these are moms who um, are fitness oriented. Um, they're mentors in local communities. They will reach out to new moms, invite them, they become a peer support. They, people with moms have questions about kids and issues of different ages, whether it be infants or toddlers. There are these support groups that they, people meet. They're not really censored heavy at all. They are very much uh, uh, communities that, that pr provide the encouragement and support for one another. But we're layering on this platform so that the mentors of these uh, local chapters have access to the mom's data to help provide them um, the tools to see you know, how they're progressing and provide feedback. Well, the CDC has this thing called Text for Tots, which is all this information they've built to try to teach moms how to have healthy behavior habits for their kids, uh, but there's no way of really getting that message out. Well, if you have a platform now that has moms working with local mentors in these support groups, and they have a tool that has a scheduling that here's the activity we're going to do today, and in the context of that, we have an opportunity to deliver on content in, that, that makes sense because there's, you have motivated people, moms who are engaging in these devices that are relevant to what they're doing, it's a great opportunity to teach and present co uh, content that they can act on. So we're looking at a platform that really is building experiences that goes alongside um, our users. Uh, so that's what we're doing. But I tried to convey that really I see it, our journey has been one of from self-help to team to really solutions. And that's been really for us to survive as a startup um, an important transition because at the end of the day, the partners that we are working with, and we have partners with hospitals, we have partners with companies who are using us for wellness programs, um, they want solutions. And having all of this data is wonderful, but we need to be able to show that they're efficacy and that um, this has been our strategy. I wouldn't say that we introduced any novel new technology. I think it's more of an aggregator and providing a solution that aggregates its content. I mean, if you, if the users of DigiFit are not, they come to us because we bring all this data together in one place. So it is just brute force, grunt work of creating a platform that integrates with all these APIs with partners who are um, you know, the Fitbits, the body medias, the whitings, having relationships with them where we can pull all this data together. So yes, they are data that's siloed in these different partners, but they are willing to work with you if there's a synergy between companies. So uh, just focusing on that. But for the most part, I'd say our real innovation is, become, is, is, is where we're going with 3.0 because we're now building experiences.
experiences, well, we want our customers who use our apps to feel like they've got a virtual partner who knows about them, who's providing advice relevant to what they're doing and what their issues are. For example, suppose you've just got a heart attack. You're in, there's going to be a whole new set of issues you need to deal with that you, your doctors want to educate with. You'll be really motivated to learn those things. But what if your device had the content, training plans dedicated towards quote, that disease recovery? Um, there's an opportunity to integrate content that already exists in the hands of the user without necessarily going to the doctor for all of that. So a platform that can, that can solve that problem is, is what we're trying to do. I don't think there's anything necessarily technically novel about each of the pieces. It's the integration, I think, that's the value. Because I thought it's like, for instance, way it's more like feedback system. So in order to make a feedback system, you might need some new device or technology. So uh, I can see that a company would be interested in a wellness program for, for employees. But the employees may not necessarily be interested in sharing data that are very personal you know, with, with the company. Correct. Uh, in fear of you know, maybe some negative consequences of some sort. So how, how do you deal with that? So we, we run Colorado, University of Colorado's MOVE program. It's the wellness program they offer to all their employees. There is an absolute firm, hard barrier between us and the University of Colorado. Uh, we deliver them a report that's really their user ID and did they meet the goal? They have a monthly goal of a combination of steps and days and activity that, that we manage for them. But we definitely have the HIPAA fire rules that at the end of the day, they, it's, if the employees, it's their data, they opt into it. If they decide to do that, only the result, do they meet that goal, goes to, to, to that system. So, and that's really, I mean, our, our perspective is the data we have is not our data, it is the user's data. Um, and that approach has worked pretty well. They, uh, in University of Colorado, we have to be through great pains of requiring and not wanting any of this personal data. They just want to know, did they qualify for the program or not? Yeah, so there's, HIPAA, HIPAA is the, uh, the user's friend in that case. There's, there's pretty stringent requirements for HIPAA. We'll have to save it for later. Thank you. How about a round of applause? <laughs> Next, uh, we have the distinction of uh, bringing uh, Mr. Dave Merritt, sorry, Marit, uh, from Fujitsu. Uh, he is the VP of Connected Information Innovation Center. Um, he's one of the few individuals I've met who has been recognized as the digital dozen. Uh, he was one of the 12 most influential uh, people in the digital world, uh, recognized by Time Magazine in 2001. Um, He's going to be talking about sensor-based healthcare uh, from automated technologies. Hi folks, thanks for um, your time and attention today. Hopefully we'll make this interesting enough to, to keep you riveted. Um, I really appreciated the previous two talks, uh, partly because I have too much to talk about and they covered a certain amount of the material. So hopefully they'll, that'll form a good basis for what I want to talk about today. So. The event here is about quantified self, right? That's the movement that's happening about people tracking their own data. And part of what I wanted to do today is push the thinking a little bit harder and say, what's next? Where is it going? And that's why I'm talking about quantified subjectivity, right? Actually quantifying people's subjective states, which sounds like a bit of an oxymoron, right? Like a contradiction in terms. Um, human centricity and self-tracking. And the context for human centricity for this talk comes from President Yamamoto. I hope you all know President Yamamoto. He's president of Fujitsu. And he said that Fujitsu's vision for a new society is the human-centric intelligence society. We can all pretty quickly conjure up what we might mean by an intelligence society. You know, things that are instrumented and censored and acting on that sensing, big data, and so on. But what about human-centric? What does that really mean? Well, it's good for people, people at the center. Okay, what does it really mean? And, and in that context, how can we, I'm from Fujitsu Labs, how can we in the lab help realize this vision of a human-centric intelligent society? So I want to argue that self-quantification is a part of that, and that, quantific that uh, quantification is more human-centric 
when it tracks our emotions, when it tracks our subjective state. So uh, what can the technology do? You guys have seen a lot of this stuff in the previous talks. You may know about it already. The important point I wanted to bring up here is for people who don't believe us, we the quantified self enthusiasts, there's a lot of technology out there already for sensing a lot of different things, for tracking a lot of different things, and it's at the consumer level. These are consumer products. You don't have to go to the doctor and spend huge amounts of money if you want to be able to track your sleep. Right? There's a Zio device and many others that can do that. <clears throat> um, we probably all know the Fitbit. How many folks here have a Fitbit? A few. How many know about the Fitbit? Okay, cool. The little accelerometer device you put in your pocket. It tracks your steps, as has been discussed, whatever step means. <clears throat> and then you can have that data go up to the web and you can look at graphs and charts and so on. Um, this is Philips' ill-fated uh, imitation of the Fitbit. This is the Luma back. I believe those folks are going to be here today. It helps you keep track of your posture and so on. So lots of consumer level devices available now around the $100 to $200 price point today. Um, <clears throat> these things are evolving very quickly. So when we started doing some of our work, we had to use our work at the lab. We had to use a device called a Zephyr chest strap. It's a, tra a chest strap that you would wear like this. It cost around $450. Actually, a couple of years before that, it was $750. You'd wear this uncomfortable chest strap. It was okay for a few hours. I tried wearing it for three days, and I got this awful rash. But it was worth it, guys. Oops. Uh-oh. A um, little tech support here? Thanks. It was worth it because I got all this great data. The Zephyr chest strap tracks acceleration, which gives you footsteps. It tracks posture. It tracks skin temperature, galvanic skin response, and it'll track um, uh, EKG, gives you a heart rate monitor. Thank you. What's amazing is now there's a company that's just starting to come to market, Vital Connect. All the functionality of this chest strap is available in a band-aid that you can put on. And you put the Band-Aid on and you wear it for three days. It's pretty cool. And their price target is $2 a day. <coughs> Not bad. Um, and they're hoping soon to have one that you can put on and wear 15 days. So now we heard in the previous talks what a headache it is to put on all these sensors and deal with all the logistics and we need to improve this and that. That's certainly true, but it's coming. I mean, when I saw that uh, Vital Connect patch the first time, I was blown away. It's like, this is a vision come true. We all hear about Moore's Law. There it is. And in fact, um, all these sensors that I have illustrated here are available today pretty much at the consumer level. All these sensors are actually small computers, essentially. You can think of them as small computers. If you think of them that way, you'll recognize that they're going to get smaller and cheaper on Moore's Law. They already are. So what happens when they get them? I mean, just do the projection, right? What happens when in a year and a half it can be half the size or half the price? You kind of keep cutting, cutting, cutting. Pretty soon, the sensors are so small, we will all have them on us, in us, and around us all the time. It's going to happen. It's inevitable. It's like when the first person said, oh, computers are getting smaller and cheaper. Pretty soon they'll be in doorknobs. Doorknobs? What are you talking about? Now you go to a hotel, right? All the doorknobs have computers in them. Same thing is going to happen with the sensors. So in that world, Right? How will the technology and market evolve to support this future world that I'm describing when these sensors are all on us, in us, and around us all the time? So we have this argument that the world you see today, and it was cited by Rachel, um, the systems that are available are vertically integrated, right? The same, think Fitbit. The same company makes the sensor, the little gizmo, does the analysis of that data stream, it right, goes from accelerometer patterns, acceleration patterns, to footsteps. And then offers a service, a service or a set of services based on that analysis. Right, vertically integrated, one company controlling the whole thing. And we argued back in 2011 that this model would persist from 2011 to about 2013. So now we argue from around 2013 on, you're going to get a much more heterogeneous model where you'll have many sensors produced by different vendors combining with different analysis modules potentially produced by yet other vendors then the output of those will recombine into a variety of services provided by potentially yet another set of vendors you may have one vendor that provides all three but you're also likely to have this heterogeneous environment and that's because 
vertically integrated systems don't persist as markets evolve. As evolve. There, there are exceptions, but broadly speaking, that's the way it plays out. Right? So in this context, we thought, gee, we're the guys in the lab. Where should we be? Where should Fujitsu be? And we said there's going to be a need for a glue layer to collect data from all these different sensors, to house all the different analytic software and run it, and then to support all these services that can come out at the other end. So we built a gizmo, a hardware gizmo we call the Sprout. Um, and here's one of them, which you guys are welcome to look at if you touch me afterwards. So this guy uh, is basically a small computer. All the sensors talk to it. It speaks Wi-Fi, BGN, Bluetooth 3.0, um, BLE. It's got uh, an ARM9 processor and so on. You can read the specs. But the basic idea is it's a small computer that's designed to listen to all the sensors, collect the data, synchronize the data from the different heterogeneous sensor streams, clean it up, and then do analysis, do analytics on the sensor streams in the context of each other. Right? Part of the argument is you can't really understand what's going on from just one sensor stream. You need multiple data streams to contextualize each other. And then it's got uh, an Apache, it's running an Apache web server, so it can spit out web pages that can be viewed in real time or non-real time. So that's the gizmo. Um, we predicted way back when, and it has come true, uh, as all these different functionalities move to mobile phones, this will move to the mobile phone as well. In fact, we now have this whole system running on Android. So you can just use an Android phone and don't need the gizmo. So here's one of the things we did. Um, we decided it would be really cool to instrument people and then put the results of the instrumentation in their field of view in a constant sort of passive way. So we worked with an insurance company in New York um, and we gave them all the ugly, horrible Zephyr chest straps because that's what was available at the time. No hit against Zephyr, totally state of the art at the time. Um, and down in the bottom corner, you can see an older version of our little Sprout device that was listening to the data stream coming off the Zephyr, grinding, spitting out web pages that are being viewed in real time on a tablet computer on the guy's desk, tucked in amongst the pictures of his children and other tchotchkes. Okay? And the question was, what would the subjective experience be like of seeing this data in your context, ambiently? So this is what we showed. Uh, we could show posture, we had activity level, respiration rate, that's breaths per minute, heart rate, and then to me much more interesting, stress levels, current stress and stress over the last hour. And that's a computation based on a variety of changes in heartbeat patterns we can talk about if anybody's interested. Um, so that was the view that they got sitting on their desk all the time. We in the back room got the geekier view. Right? And it was actually extremely interesting, so let's just talk about this for a minute. This is a few minutes, a few seconds, excuse me, of heart data, just to make sure the system is all working. This is the heart rate over an eight-hour period. And I don't know how clear it is here. Um, on the bottom trace, we've got the blue line is the instantaneous value of the person's psychophysical stress. And the red line is the moving one-hour average. So if you're above your one-hour average, you're more stressed than you've been over the last hour. If you're below it, you're less stressed. Okay. And what's interesting is people think, oh, stress is bad. If I'm stressed, it's bad. Well, that's true to an extent, but it's really more about the time course. So this guy's stress is up and down all day long. And in fact, that is a healthy pattern of stress. Your body should be reacting to what's going on around it. Okay. Here's another person's data. And this is a very different model. Um, this guy was usually pretty even keeled, by the way. And you can see during the course of the day, something happens here and his stress level spikes. Um, it's a good story, I don't have time for it now. I'll tell you later if you're really interested. But the guy gets very stressed and then he starts thinking about it more and more. And you can see, he gets stressed, recovers, thinks about it, and he gets more and more stressed, it goes up and up, and he has this high stress level for the rest of the day. That's the stress that kills you. Okay. I'm sorry? He's fired from the job? That's right, maybe, well maybe they want that. Uh, maybe he'll die before he gets fired, right? I mean, this, this stuff is really nasty. So, but the point is, we could actually look at this, and we brought the guy in and said, oh my God, what happened at 2.30 on Thursday? You know, because we could tell something. He said, oh, it was terrible, and he tells us the whole story. Right? So, the point is, there's real insight to be garnered here. So, here's another uh, 
You know, the situation we had to deal with, we're going to go to a trade show. We want to demonstrate our system, our platform, and our stress algorithm. It's hard to get volunteers to stress, to get stressed, right? Anybody want to be stressed? Come on over. It doesn't work. So what we decided to do was the opposite. We'd measure the inverse of stress, which we roughly call relaxation. So this is us testing our, our relaxation system in the lab before we take it to the trade show floor. This is our CEO. We brought in a masseuse, a massage practitioner, on a massage chair. We instrumented the person with a little finger cuff, a little PPG, photoplethysmograph, that communicated wirelessly to our platform running on a Fujitsu Android phone. And we could watch the stress level during the course of a three to five minute massage. So um, moderate, this is what we ended up doing at the trade show. So this is our CEO's data, actually. So here's his relaxation level during the setup period, right, instrumenting him. And higher is, in this case, higher is more relaxed. Okay, so he's a certain, somewhat arbitrary number. Then during the course of the massage, he gets significantly more relaxed. And after the massage, he comes back down a little bit, but not as far down as he was when he started. So this is evidence that massage works. Okay, fine. It's not a big surprise to anybody, but actually, we did have a lot of debate institutionally. Can you really measure stress? You know, and I don't know. Are you really is it good stress? Nobody quite believed us. But when we brought in the massage practitioner and got all the executives to volunteer to get their their uh, stress level tested, uh, so we could test our system, suddenly all those arguments stopped. People believed it because they had a subjective experience, right? Their subjective experience was, "Wow, I feel more relaxed." Oh, look, there it is in the numbers. So this is pretty cool. Um, getting this quantification of a subjective state, right? Something we don't typically think about. So um, this is David Palmer. Is anyone in here, I bet no one here knows who David Palmer is. Anybody recognize this guy, know who he is? He's actually a very famous guy in a completely different community. David Palmer is the guy who invented the massage chair. How cool is that, right? He invented the massage chair. And he heard about what we were doing and he was very excited about the idea that you could actually objectively measure massage. So he came to our lab and started giving people massages and watching the data. And by the way, all this data is, although it's being displayed on a big screen TV, is coming off of the little Fujitsu mobile phone running our software. And it was very interesting because in this case, uh, and I'm, I'm overstating it, but he doesn't really care so much about the person he's massaging. He cares about himself. He's trying to see how good a job am I doing? How good am I at conducting massage? So in a very interesting way, this person is becoming the sensor that's measuring him. All right, you follow me? That? That's a bit of a conceptual loop. Right? The sensor is not the little PPG on her finger. The person with the PPG on her finger is the sensor for him. Okay? So let's take a slightly different story. Once we started measuring stress, we started tracking ourselves. And again, the purpose of our platform, remember, is to combine different heterogeneous data streams and analyze them in the context of each other. So we started uh, instrumenting ourselves on our commute. Uh, this is my colleague Ajay's data, stress data, as he drives from, from work to home at 9 p.m. He works too hard. Um, and it's probably not super visible uh, on the data projector, but the way this is mapped, um, the cooler colors are more relaxed, the warmer colors are more stressed. I don't know if you can tell, he's sort of more yellow here in the first half of the drive, and his colors go towards the green during the second half of the drive. So he's actually, it takes about half the drive, about half, about half an hour, to start calming down after he leaves work, start de-stressing. And interestingly enough, we expected the reverse behavior on the drive to work, that he'd be stressed, uh, relaxed for the first half and stressed for the second half. In fact, he's kind of stressed the whole way. <laughs> so, this has led to certain behavioral changes that Ajay, who's in the back of the room, will be happy to tell you about, I'm sure, over dinner. Um, so, my data was slightly different. You can tell straight off the bat, this is just my driving to work one day, that my colors are a lot cooler to begin with. So, I'm just a more relaxed guy, or maybe I don't take life as seriously. Um, but, okay, so that's interesting. What's more interesting is this little part at the very end as I get off the freeway, and that's blown up here. And you can see that as I come off the freeway, my color temperature, which is my stress, drops dramatically just as I get off the freeway. Now, I enjoy my job, but it is stressful, so this made no sense to me. I told all the, all the coders that they had a cyan. Right? So, no, you got a cyan. Something's wrong here. 
And three different coders checked it and there was no sign error. So the next day when I drove to work, I kind of watched myself, like what is going on here? And the story is that I'm actually, I'm a meditator. I med I'm not a great meditator, but I meditate 10 minutes every morning and every night. And I've been doing it for a few years. And the next day when I drove to work, I realized that as I was getting off the freeway, I started to calm myself and to center myself to prepare for work. And that led the stress level as detected by our system to plummet. And it's very interesting because this tells us that not only is stress tracking cool and kind of interesting, but it's actionable, right? This goes back to the comment about, gee, can having a Fitbit, you know, is a Fitbit really going to do anything? Well, no, and either a set of running shoes, and either a bicycle, and I mean, none of that's going to do None of that's going to do anything. An education, right? None of that's going to do anything. You've got to use it. Um, you've got to act on it. But knowing your stress level is actionable. And that was pretty cool. So, um, anybody recognize this image? I'm oh, sorry? Tokyo subway map. That's correct. The Tokyo subway map. This is something we have not done, but it's a cool idea that I want to share with you. Okay? We have that case of the woman with the, the finger clip being a sensor for the masseuse, right? Imagine if we instrumented all of the train drivers in Tokyo, all the subway train drivers in Tokyo with those little stick-on patches, and we tracked their stress, okay? And then in the same way that you saw my stress mapped on the 280, right? We took their stress and we mapped aggregate stress, average across all the drivers on the Tokyo subway map. Then you could see which parts of the route are most stressful for the drivers. Okay? And you can have all the traffic engineers you want looking at curves and rates and traffic and so on. They're not going to be able to tell you which parts are most stressful to the drivers and hence which parts are still the most dangerous. But if there's a certain curve for whatever reason, lights shining off some building or there's a noisy school nearby, whatever it is, there's some spot that's more stressful for all those drivers. You're going to get insights into the system that you wouldn't get any other way by using the people as sensors. And we argue that this is true for potentially train systems and hospitals and schools and prisons and factory floors, any complex system that you want to monitor. In fact, people can become the sensors. So the, the, sub the, the subjective states of the people inform us about the systems that they are a part of. So that quantified self starts pointing in both directions. So I want to just quickly put up a taxonomy of stress applications, and I will argue, but I'm not quite convinced yet, that this is a taxonomy of all subjective tracking applications. I'm not sure, but I'll throw that idea out. Maybe we can mull it together, right? So it's a two by two matrix, like so many things. Um, this is tracking one's own stress and someone else's stress, and this is standalone and matched up, right? So this guy's looking at his own stress level, standalone. This is someone else's stress level, standalone as informing the massage process. Here's my stress level matched up with my GPS data. And this is the idea of many people's data, matched, you know, several people's data matched up with each other and with location data. So it's an interesting notion. A um, couple more things quickly. We've undergone quite a bit of evolution on our Sprout platform. Uh, originally, the question was, what would it be like to be instrumented and tracked all the time, and one of our teammates um, spent a month, literally a month, with a netbook in his backpack or his hand, a blood pressure cuff, a PPG, an accelerometer, um, living instrumented back 2011, 2010, before you could do it any other way. That was the first instantiation. Then we built our version of this, the Sprout, the first version, which was essentially replacing the netbook. Um, now the new version of the Sprout hardware, we call it the Hard Sprout because it's a hardware device. Now the Soft Sprout, and coming soon, is an open API to the Sprout running on the Android platform. So if folks are interested in playing with this, I'll, we'll take questions. If folks are interested in playing with this, please send an email to ajc at us.fujitsu.com. Uh, Ajay, would you stand up real quick? He's over there. So that's ajc. You can talk to Ajay if you're interested in playing around with the Open API when that becomes available soon. Um, so some questions, right? There's so many questions here that could be asked, but I'm not going to let you ask the questions, I'm asking the questions, right? So some questions. Uh, what subjective states can we measure objectively? We've got an objective measurement of stress. It's 
pretty cool. It's relative for each person, but it's an objective measurement of stress. Um, what subjective states can we measure subjectively? Right? And where does the distinction between objective and subjective break down? What are the implications of measuring our own subjective states and of measuring other people's subjective states? Right? Should it ever be mandatory? Right? That's a weird question, but like, we can measure, we can detect drowsiness. Okay, drowsiness can be detected by looking at patterns in heartbeats. Okay, heart rate variability changes, well, well understood stuff. Should all school bus drivers have their drowsiness be tracked? Not an unreasonable question. How about airplane pilots? Not an unreasonable question. Is that a slippery slope? Well, that's another question, right? Um, and finally, how can quantification of subjective states serve as input to higher order understanding? Right, when we quantify all the people's, all the drivers' stress on the train system, for example, are there other instances of that that would be interesting and relevant? So that's sort of the quick wrap up. I tried to go through this very quickly. I know there's a lot of ideas in there. Um, so let me stop there, and I guess we'll take a couple questions now. I don't know how far behind we are. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Let me introduce uh, the next speaker uh, before we break for the dinner session. Um, this is Patrick Egan, and he's from. Uh, Qualcomm Ventures. So he's the he's currently the investment director at Qualcomm Ventures based in San Francisco. Um, he is also, as in his role, he's also uh, sits on the board of many uh, companies, including Chacha, Educat, Enterprise, Kalia Software, um, Iscent, Mutual, and ThinkMir. I suspect everyone's familiar with Qualcomm. I hope that's the case. Largest oil and gas company. No, I'm joking. So <laughs> Uh, but I, I assume most of you are not so familiar with Qualcomm Ventures, so I'm going to give sort of a quick commercial of Qualcomm Ventures. We'll dive into a very high-level perspective of how, from an investment standpoint, we're looking at sensor-based activity. But keep it pretty high-level, um, pretty short and brief, not going into any depth, and then, and then with the Q&A. But Qualcomm Ventures, so um, quickly, just... Uh, uh, we are, to use a sensor theme, sort of a metaphorical sensor for the company in the sense of Qualcomm based in San Diego, um, mothership. Um, uh, we have folks all over the world that scour the sort of mobile ecosystem to harvest and invest, not to acquire um, uh, investments in very disruptive early stage companies. So on the far left, um, I think that sort of symbolizes sort of a metaphorical sensor. Then we support our corporate and business units. We do not do pure strategic investments. Um, we have another group in the company that does that. We will not invest to acquire. Uh, we invest um, at the very early stage for disruptive companies, and we don't need business unit pulls. So that makes us pretty unique with respect to our corporate peers. Um, and then ultimately, just to proliferate and accelerate the, the growth of wireless. I think the way we look at it now, uh, 10, 15 years ago with CDMA, it was sort of a different ecosystem build. Now it's just sort of harvesting the mobile ecosystem and, and enhancing that. So we, I think we perceive ourselves much more as sort of ecosystem investors uh, and quiet company builders. And then ultimately we're driven by financial returns. Um, in terms of just some quick stats, balance sheet fund, 500 million plus, we deployed about 75 million last year. We have 30 folks, I think it's 26, so unless we hired four people in the last uh, three hours, but uh, 30, 30 folks, 100 active portfolio companies. Uh, what makes us unique is uh, half of our team is based overseas, um, uh, both India, China, Korea, Brazil, UK, and uh, I think I said Israel. Um, and uh, we invest across the ecosystem, so that includes both hardware and software. Those folks are um, sort of surprised to know that we have such software exposure. We have about two-thirds on the software side in terms of our investment portfolio. Um, consumer apps, healthcare is a big area for us. We have a dedicated healthcare fund, uh, 100 million plus, that invests in all remote uh, monitoring of healthcare and, and, and life sciences. Um, and finally, CE, again, sort of a sensor-based uh, aspect. In terms of, again, you can't, it looks like the um, animation is off a bit. In terms of track record, last few years, uh, three separate billion plus exits. Waze, um, which was a recent exit, very polarizing at the time when we invested, but uh, crowdsourcing of handset data for traffic. Think of handsets as wireless probes, exploiting the sort of sensor data coming from GPS. 
uh, NetGin, which is a Chinese uh, mobile security company, similar to Lookout in the U.S., uh, and then Invensys, which was sole supplier to Nintendo Wii uh, controller, so in the motion sensor. Uh, sensor. Um, and then in terms of our scope all over the world, um, it's very challenging to organize a conference call. So you can imagine, unfortunately, India gets, uh, gets the worst, but um, we, you know, the sun doesn't sleep. Uh, in, in our office, and I have colleagues, uh, nine of which are based overseas. Um, so quickly, so, so sensors, why is it important to Qualcomm? So up front, Qualcomm is not a sensor company. We are very good at integrating sensors. Um, and so, hence I think we lie at this crossroads. It's, you know, it's a very interesting perspective where we stand right now. Um, important note that sensors are not new. I mean, sensors, in terms of GPS, pretty much been sort of de facto standard on the GPS front, but have been around since 2005. Uh, accelerometers, 2007 in handsets, uh, given the iPhone. Um, but our thesis is that we're really at a tipping point right now, I think driven by sort of three primary catalysts. The first of which is um, you, you have this critical mass and proliferation of sensors in, in, in handsets. So it's, it's essentially table stakes for these OEMs to have 10 plus sensors in the phones. Uh, two is you have these really innovative use cases that consumers are demanding. So you have this pull um, on the OEM to integrate sensors and to enable context aware gesture imaging, quantified self use cases. And finally, programmable APIs, the introduction of third party, um, the, the introduction of open APIs that allow third-party developers to innovate above and beyond so the initial um, expectation of, of what those sensors were supposed to drive. We think that the latter is the most interesting aspect in really driving uh, innovation in the ecosystem. Um, on the, so, so innovation's happening at sort of three different layers here. On the hardware side, you have a lot of cost erosion. Um, you also have, uh, you know, these, these are, again, table stakes for the OEM. Um, where we see, or where we think the most, and I, I believe Rachel brought this up bef before, it's not necessarily the precision or latency that we think is the most important variable, but we think it's battery consumption. Um, these devices are always with us, always need to be on and have to be optimized for, for, um, for performance um, effectively all day. So we think battery consumption uh, is, is utterly the most important variable to the success of these sort of standalone apps or devices. Ultimately, our thesis is that 30% of the apps are uninstalled because of battery consumption. Just uninstalled and, and, and go away, and, and once you lose a user, uh, very challenging to get them back. Um, and in terms of software, um, ultimately a lot of these, in terms of the raw sensor data, uh, very complex data structures. So we've seen a lot of innovation on the software side uh, particularly um, uh, you know, with our Snapdragon processor, we have a, a SDK, and there's a lot of other software development kits out there that essentially take these complex data sets and make them um, you know, expose much more visible APIs and allow much easier applications um, or to, to exploit a different sensor uh, flexibility or, or functionality. So that, that's another key point. Um, and then ultimately, where does that, you know, the byproduct is, and, and, a lot has been mentioned about quantified self. Um, we're very bullish on quantified self. Um, our group, I think, is probably more excited about two other use cases. The first of which is UI, sort of next generation gesture-based UIs. Um, and the other one is, is sort of context aware, the fact that the phone knows where you are, what's around you, and um, you know, sort of situation analysis. A little creepy, but the context aware aspect actually has a lot of very relevant use cases. So we're very bullish on those two specific cases, UI and context aware. Um, in terms of the hardware innovation, I mean, today on the left, essentially we see sort of 10 uh, sensors in the phone right now. So location, again, table stakes, effectively 100% attach rate, at least the high-end smartphone. Um, uh, again, ways um, essentially uh, exploited um, the, the GPS to create uh, the strategic asset of having a alternative map out there. Uh, accelerometer, again, and gyroscope, essentially table stakes right now. Best use case we see a lot of times is image stabilization 
or gaming control. A lot of uh, a lot of third-party apps are using are using that. And the compass again, sort of table stakes. Um, but early on, Yelp even used the compass as sort of a very like low-end augmented reality application. Um, barometer um, on the barometer side, a lot of sort of enterprise tracking maps, enhanced navigation, um, ambient lighting, essentially allowing um, uh, the display to turn off or, or reduce based on power consumption. Um, we have an ancient company that takes advantage of both barometer and ambient lighting to sort of extract weather. A company called Open Signal Maps in the UK, which is a com combination of, of battery temperature, ambient, uh, light and barometer to extract weather conditions in specific areas. So we think that the most innovative apps are using a sort of collection of sensors and using them in different ways that were never sort of intended for. Um, on the microphone side, uh, we have a very interesting company called um, AliveCore, which uh, does ECG heart rate monitoring and effectively takes ultrasound, transmits it through the microphone and able to uh, give you um, a sort of rudimentary heart rate monitoring. Uh, we see that as well with um, uh, Shopkick. Shopkick, uh, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with in, the, in sort of legacy early technology, had hardware in the stores that used a microphone to sort of detect fidelity of data or to imply if you were actually in the store as opposed to sort of a false check-in. Um, camera, uh, a lot, they were very bullish, computer vision and uh, really um, high fidelity image recognition. Um, also, our Vuforia platform, Qualcomm's Vuforia platform, uses the camera as a high-end augmented reality platform. Um, and then the fingerprint, obviously the recent uh, announcement from Apple just brings more credibility to the sort of security use case. Um, they're you know, manifested by their authentic um, acquisition of probably about a year ago. We have a similar thesis around a company called Validity, which did uh, biometric sensing on the PC that ultimately will come to touch screens as well. So, so very bullish on that. The future retina will be very similar use cases on security. A thermo thermometer was, uh, was mentioned before um, in terms of detecting hazardous uh, materials. Really interesting use case. Uh, and then environmental, again, more of the quantified self, um, which is life uh, lifestyle, fitness, heart rate monitoring, um, and ultimately multi-sensor. So um, if you use right now two to four uh, microphones on the phone, you can actually you can actually create an alternative UI or gesture tech, uh, sorry, a gesture-based UI. So really innovative cases, and, and we think, again, that the, 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 more, um, the more clever that uh, third-party app developers exploit these sensors, we'll, we'll see the most innovative use cases. Um, quickly on the, on the uh, software eleva, uh, evolution, uh, sort of, you know, Google on, on Android has done some incredible stuff um, it, in terms of opening up and allowing sort of standard APIs and the linear acceleration, the gravitational uh, rotation vector. But there are, there are SDKs that sort of pull out a lot more sensor data. Uh, the facial analysis, the, as I mentioned before, the, the touch-free swipe, like very interesting stuff that um, in its, if you just use the sort of core Android API, it's just not exposed. So Snapdragon SDK sort of enables this, but at the same time really sort of consumes the proper battery, uh, um, always on, um, but doesn't, um, it, it just, just proper management uh, of battery consumption. Uh, in terms of innovative UIs, again, we're, we're very bullish on sort of two of these use cases innovative UIs and, and, and context aware. I think on the first, um, th there's about three or four companies that, that we've seen recently that really exploit um, sort of next gen uh, 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 innovative UIs, one of which is called a, a company called Kikso that actually um, based on the stuff, it, it can differentiate via ambient sensors a fingernail, a thumb, uh, a knuckle, or a stylus. So effectively it's a figurative sort of right click. Um, very interesting company that exploits touchscreen technology. Uh, Haptics, uh, 3D motion sensor that allows any surface to um, offer a sort of alternative keyboard. 
a company called Q26 that we're meeting with tomorrow that allows a touchless call management, similar to what Samsung S4 has for a lot of uh, Indian OEMs. Um, then on the context aware side, again, so it sort of all comes together if you think about the use case where, um, say, you know, again, context aware is sort of predicated on the following, that your smartphone is always with you, it's always on, and it knows what's around you. And ultimately, that has to be done in a very sort of efficient and, and manner, but it's a very entitled place to be because it essentially um, infers all about your daily activity and, and what, uh, um, it, so, so, so hence it can intelligently push out really, um, I, would, I would say, uh, uh, push notifications that aren't perceived as noise or spam. So the ca case in point here is um, precision indoor navigation, next gen sort of precision indoor nav that will come like plus three, five meters can determine if you're in a conference room. Um, proximity sensor can, can detect a colleague is to your left or right in the same conference room or, or, or a boarding conference room, hence then he or she can realize if they are connected on LinkedIn. And then ultimately, proximity sensing. Um, if, if, uh, if the phone is up um, against the ear, if they're talking, the microphone will pick that up. So perhaps based on the collection of data from all these sensors, um, we, it can have an intelligent step of pushing it to voicemail or staying idle or mute. So again, so this is context aware, um, again, it's, it's just one use case of, of many, but as we talk a lot about quantified self, I think it's important to understand the sort of next-gen UI and the innovative applications on that front based on gesture technologies, as well as sort of context-aware based on a lot of innovative cases of extrapolating info from several different sensors. And I think that's where the most innovative and interesting uh, startups that we'll see in the next few years based on sensor technology will come from. So, that's all I have. This is a question to the panel. Where are we uh, from a product evolution standpoint in QS? Uh, I read some comments on the web that we are at 0 0.1, which I don't really agree with. Um, is this something that can be sustained? Because the, the data collected so far you know, says that 67% of uh, QS users discontinue using it after three weeks. So how do you get them interested? How do you preach the value uh, uh, and the benefits of QS in whether it's individual's life or collective, uh, enterprise format, family, whatever? So have a go at it. So. I don't think you should have to preach. I think if the value is not clear, you shouldn't use it. Um, and I also think that at this point, quantified self, the movement is not necessarily the same as self-tracking, but uh, quantified self is B-Y-O-Q, like bring your own question. If you don't have a question, you're not necessarily going to get an answer. Maybe you'll find something interesting, but chances are you're just gonna look at data. But I view all of these devices as kind of like the early cell phone cameras, which sucked. But the best camera is the one that you have. And so over time, they got better. And now most of us don't carry around other cameras. We just use our cell phone camera. And these are, I view as similar, like the kind of data you can get from uh, these, my wrist is buzzing, <laughs> is very limited. But the best data is the data that you have. And so people who are collecting this data will start establishing baselines for themselves. And in the future, we will start understanding how we can combine these different data streams and make it useful. But I don't think that at this point, I would say there's definitely a value to everybody wearing a tracking device. Like you should wear one if it adds value to your life, if you have a question you wanna answer. But I don't think that there's an intrinsic value to it. Also, um, there's a lot of debate about phones versus devices, I get asked all the time, like, well, don't you think that you're going to be able to do this on your phone? Why do you need those devices? Um, most of the time, the people that ask me this question are men. Men's uh, clothing has pockets that are big enough to accommodate a phone. Uh, women's clothing usually doesn't. And so for women, phones aren't as wearable. Also, uh, 
there's still many people that don't work out with their phone, and fewer people who uh, sleep with their phone, and very, very few people who swim with their phone. And so there are always going to be activities that you do that you might like to track that you can't do with your phone. And so I view the phone as becoming a hub, but uh, I think that quantified self as a movement is still in the early days, but will become more useful as we're able to understand how to work better with this data. I guess I look at the devices as like local blocks. You know, you have some that just absolutely get excited about building Legos. And the fact that there are a lot of blocks and you can do different things with them, it's fantastic. Um, others would say, you know what, I just want um, a building. And do I have to use all these Lego blocks to build it up? Um, our bodies are so complex. And it's great that we have these devices that can inform us as to what's there. But um, the quite, the, the, really, uh, you can either be curious and be, um, have your curiosity uh, uh, excited about all the data we're collecting, but if you don't have a question to bring to the table, um, it's kind of a little bit pointless. I mean, we can marvel at how, how complicated we are. Um, you can just you know, have fun building your wild Lego uh, creations, and there will be those who, just, who, who find a lot of joy out of that. There's a lot of people who say, you know what, I just don't really want to play these things anymore. I just give me a solution that works. Um, and that's the dilemma that, that in terms of quantified self, um, it's really the name to me embodies those who just delight in data, in finding and exploring. But really, they're on the frontier of seeing this data and trying to make sense out of it. And there could be some fantastic discoveries. Um, I think our founder was one of those in terms of, uh, and, and for him, it, it helped his health. But for a lot, the people, they, they would prefer that someone else maybe go through that journey and just say, give me a solution that works. Uh, currently, I see three pools, or three categories of people, right? You, there are three types of people um, that can benefit from the QS approaches right now, with self-tracking. There's the, the sick people, the ill people, who are trying to manage disease, right? I mean, how many diabetics don't track their blood sugar? There are the serious health, fitness, not athlete types who for whom knowing exactly how far they were ran and what their heart rate was is important. Then there's all the people in the middle uh, for whom, most for most of whom, the cost and benefit isn't really there. So you end up with the early adopters in that pool being the only adopters in that pool. And that's fine. And that's what most of us are talking about in the quantified self context. Ah, if you want to try, you play around, you know, it might help. That's that middle pool. No one's questioning whether diabetics should track their blood sugar. And no one's questioning whether the serious athletes can benefit by knowing what's going on physiologically. Right? But what's going to happen is as the cost of using these systems, and I mean the full panoply of cost, right? The, not only the economic cost, but the intellectual overhead and the discomfort and everything else, as that begins to shrink, you're going to get the healthy folks and the ill folks. And you don't need to be quite as much of a health nut. You don't need to be quite as sick. You need to be even you know, less of a health nut. And just kind of maybe getting sick and it'll sort of shrink and pull more and more towards the middle. And that middle section will shrink and shrink and shrink until I argue it'll go away altogether. Uh, when it's easy enough, I tell folks, you wouldn't drive a car without any instruments. You wouldn't drive a car without a speedometer or an oil light, right? Well, in the same way, it'll, it, in five, ten, 10 years from now, it would be absurd to think that you wouldn't be walking around instrumented. So anyway, yeah, that's my view of the way it's gonna play out. I, mean, I don't have too much to add, but I think the classification you gave of the three different groups, I think from our perspective, we always look to try to penetrate that latter group, the, the last group, meaning this sort of silent majority. If you can penetrate that group, because that has um, that has the most potential, the, the, the early adopter, the alpha athlete. And most, the alpha athlete most of the time is actually journaling, actually like physically journaling, they're not wearing devices. The early adopter should not be, uh, and this is some of the issue with Kickstarter right now, Kickstarter campaigns are being are developing products based on early adopter feedback, where they should be much more mainstream products. So we were we, we were recent investors in Fitbit, and, and what we found most intriguing about Fitbit was they penetrated this sort of mainstream, this fat torso, not the you know, the, the uber alpha personality or the early adopter, 
but just the sort of silent majority, the other 90, 95% is trying to lose a few pounds, a slightly obese middle-aged woman. Um, it just trying, using quantified self as a motivational tool as opposed to um, uh, just, just fascination with daily numbers. So when, when you switch it from um, to, to motivational tool, and also not make the lack of ac activity or exercise punitive, that is actually an interesting aspect as well. So we want to make sure that not using your Fitbit or not using your calorie taker for a week, it's not punitive and you don't come back. So again, I think a lot of these apps have to be focused much more on the silent majority, where Weight Watchers is effectively a marketing machine and most people actually gain weight on Weight Watchers, right? Um, so, so if you can show efficacy, and I think that question was asked before, it's a very, very fair question of, of these next-gen apps. Um, but again, we're, we're much more interested in, in the silent majority, so the other 90% that doesn't speak up, if you will. I just wanted to add something. You've got to make it fun. Like, that's why Waze is more fun than Google Maps, because you guys used Waze. Um, few of you. So it, it can help you find your route, but then they're also, uh, it's gamified, but you can have it be passive or you can have it be fun. And I think that that's a good model for these things. Make it fun, make people like to wear them. Uh, let's talk the silent majority. If you brought a good point. Silent majority needs three things. One is the low cost. Second is the convenient for their lifestyle. Third is the value added in their life. So the question is, if you look these three things for silent majority, where the variable devices reside right now? Are we looking here five year, 10 year, or 20 year, when the silent majority will grab this? So, thanks. Uh, I'm sure we all have different opinions. I'm sure we all have different opinions about that, but I mean, some would argue that with the success of Fitbit, the silent majority has already grabbed. Okay, so but Fitbit is, I mean, it's a great thing. I have one. I love it. I got one for my mom. Right? Um, Are you wearing it right now? Uh, actually, my, my, it got washed. So <laughs> I had a very clean Fitbit, but I need another one. I made the same mistake. Too. Not alone in that one. And, but that's easy. Might fall off on my bicycle. So that that's not that's not a convenient. That's right. That's, that's, usability, that's yeah. usability issue. Yeah. Yeah. But but so in that I mean so it becomes a definitional question. But I will say that within five years, uh, schoolgirls will be trading their sensors the way they trade stickers on their backpacks. Right. I mean to me that's a that's a line. You know you see these Japanese girls. I work for a Japanese company. I go, okay. See these Japanese girls. These little dangles hanging off their cell phones. Kind of like what charm bracelets used to be in the fifties. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that sensors will become that in five years. Will you be trading data? Uh, that's a separate question. That's an interesting question. Yeah, I think that I think that they will. I think. Uh, forgive me. I, just, I have to say this: all this emphasis on the privacy of medical data is, in large, not entirely, but in large part, based on the broken healthcare and insurance system in America. Like, hey, if people find out that I have some medical problem, that's going to cost me big. My insurance might get denied. I'm screwed. Right? So I think that if our medical insurance system in America gets, uh, gets rationalized somehow, then that economic underpinning of the privacy concern will be diminished. That isn't to say that there aren't other good reasons to manage the privacy, but this kind of rabid fear is justified in the context of the current insurance system. And I think that's a major driver that's not getting talked about enough. Yes, back to, okay. You have more follow-up comments? I was just going to say that we won't have to worry about privacy for these devices if we don't find a way to make them useful because then they'll just be a bad and they'll go away and there will be no privacy concerns. So uh, I worry more about how to make them useful. Also have to think about privacy, but I worry more about what if these things don't ever become useful. I mean, I can speak in very broad terms. I mean, yeah, you know, new cool sensors are hitting the market all the time. A lot of them start out really being expensive. There's cool stuff happening in the labs. This lab on a chip that Rachel mentioned, right? Imagine having something that's constantly giving you, you know, doing continuous, you know, you're going to get your blood test stuff, right? Imagine you're getting that data continuously. You can plot it and chart it and see how it varies with other factors. I mean, this stuff is coming. So yeah, and, and back in the lab, we play this game. Like, I can name that disease in how many sensors? 
Right. What sense is what I need in order to name this, in order to name that? So that's the idea of there'll be a nonlinear um, increase in functionality with respect to the number of sensors. But right. you double the number of sensors, if you can combine the data streams, you can get much more than a doubling of the number of types of services. So you're going to get this huge efflorescence of services soon, I argue. Especially if we have better batteries. Um, I also think that standards is a big, plays a big part. Um, with BLE, there's a consortium that is developing standards for a, a whole plethora of um, sensors. And before that came about, uh, literally talking to a Garmin AMP plus to, I mean, it, 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 you, you basically have one-off integrations with lots of different sensors. But with the emergence of bodies who are coming up with standards, that's helping to define what those parameters are. And if we have more capable sensors that will do more processing locally, then the standards will define what that data will represent. But that, that has to be there, I, I believe. Um, one early area that we were applying some of this technology to was a project we called Baby Track. And we looked at the pregnancy as a nine month, highly motivated mom who was interested in a healthy delivery. And if you, we, we looked at that as a, quote, what I would call like a disease. It's, it's, it is a program we're trying to intervene to, to help achieve a healthy outcome. So when you have the solutions that help guide people who are highly motivated, and in that case, if you can result in um, even a few weeks um, later of uh, occurrence of premature births, you're saving enormous costs. So delivering solutions that help um, that are targeting uh, problems. Um, that, that's that's how I see you can because there there's a huge motivation for both uh, in that case the family, um, the companies who pay you know the, the, the huge cost uh, every few weeks earlier of a premature birth is enormous uh, enormously expensive. But now I'll extend that to other disease states. So if you come up with solutions where you're applying this data, people will be motivated. Ultimately, if it, if it results in healthier um, outcomes, you'll have a huge appetite. I think there are also a lot of opportunities for uh, tools that people can use at home rather than going in to, say, see a doctor as people move to higher and higher deductible health care plans. If it costs, a, if you have a $200 copay to go see your doctor and you can use this triage tool on your phone or something like CellScope where you can take a video of your kid's ear infection or ear and then send it to a doctor. Like there's real value there because you don't have to spend the time or money to go bring your otherwise healthy kid to a clinic with sick kids. And so as the healthcare system changes, there are going to be a lot of opportunities there as well. Specifically on the Fitbit side or any of the devices, I mean, hardware is a tough business, right? Low margin, high cost of acquisition. Lots of networking capital required. Now, Fitbits are broke through. By the way, full disclosure, we passed on Fitbit twice before finally investing. It was a little more expensive this time, I'll, I'll say that. But from the Fitbit perspective, they've been exceptional at pushing out the devices. They've been less exceptional at the value add services. And the advertising has been a challenge as well. And I tend to agree with you that's sort of the last thing you want after forking out $99 or $149, whatever the price point. I think where it becomes more interesting is that there's enough value in return that there's the possibility of a recurring subscription model. You know, the, the, the best precedent out there right is, is called like Dropcam. Uh, Dropcam has a remote video monitoring. They sell these devices for about 150. Uh, they have like a 30% attach rate on a month over month recurring subscription like 10 bucks. So you do like the CPA, measure against the LTV, and these things just start to print money. And you get an attach rate that high. If Fitbit and some of the other devices can sort of uh, convert a hardware purchase into a recurring monthly subscription, mm -hmm. they need to show value. Um, and, and, and that's what's struggle. Uh, for the silent majority, they need to show efficacy. Uh, there's also alternative business models like lead generation, push into um, service providers, nutritionists, gym memberships, et cetera. The problem with lead gen is you sort of lose the relationship with the customer. You get a quick tariff and they sort of deflect and <laughs> go in different direction. So I hear, I think a lot of the business model innovation right now, or innovation like you know, or experimentation, um, still has a long way to go. And I think more so on the premium 
sort of value add services. And I think sponsorship and advertising is, is sort of dicey. So I tend to I tend to agree with your with your concerns. So I'll just pop a couple levels of abstraction here. Um, there's this notion of externalities, right? Where you you drink something, you're not really paying the cost for it, right? The guys have a factory and they're polluting the air, and we all pay for the pollution because we breathe this junk. But in fact, we can make money off of an externality. They don't pay for that, right? Well, in a way, this is the inverse problem, right? If I have some device that makes me healthier, um, then my medical costs go down. I don't bear most of those anyways. That's the insurance companies and all the the community at large. Um, so the the connection between the health and the externality or inverse externality isn't evident. But I think with IT, it will become clearer and clearer what the relationship is between my health and my cost. <coughs> and um, when that connection becomes clearer, then the value will be evident and monetizable. Does that make sense? I know it's sort of a weird abstract way of looking at it, but that, that's how I think about it. I think you make too much sense. <laughs> Next question from me. Well, my question is, what is the kind of uh, acceptance uh, no, uh, of the quanti quantified self data among providers? Uh, I kind of believe that, you know, like uh, providers that doesn't have, they are not prepared as of today, you know, to actually, you know, believe in the data that we collect, you know, from various devices and applications. Mm -hmm. Or maybe for various reasons, including the their infrastructure is not prepared enough to you know, you know, digest the data that we are able to you know pump in there, in their systems. So when do you think you know like uh, the adoption level will be you know um, so you know reach a level where you know we could actually you know start you know these the revenue models start making sense basically. I kind of believe that you know uh, the business models are not really working out today mainly because. The adoption among providers is not really, you know, uh, to the current status. I mean, I don't want to just like go too far down the game of when, right? We can also throw our darts. But um, it's interesting. I heard recently, I heard a year or so ago, when Google Health Law was still doing its thing, where they would collect basically all your QS data, you could put this giant data set, and Google would hold it for you. So um, uh, Stanford Medical Center told their doctors, do not accept that data. Do not look at that data. Mm -hmm. right, really interesting. It's like, what are you talking about? Why not? It's good data. Well, because if, if someone hands the doctor a big stack of data, and Rachel mentioned this, right, is the doctor liable if they don't go through it, or if they go through it but they miss something? So this is a new world, and the regulatory system hasn't figured out how to deal with it yet. So that's one of the issues, right? Um, but, you know, every, all these diabetics track their blood sugar and the doctors look at that. So I think it's more of a, um, a regulatory and cultural <coughs> issue. I don't think it's so much a technological issue. Is it more like, you know, something that's approved by, as you said, just said, regulatory bodies like FDA, for example, the, the Medtronic device that one of you brought up is approved, uh, you know, by the Federal you know, Drug Administration. Uh, if that kind of... Uh, you know, move happens. Do you foresee uh, you know, insurance companies or others or even medical profession accepting this as quote unquote you know legally valid data? Yeah, I do. Do you guys have thoughts? I think for how the health community has been uh, how it's been structured to work with the data and the litigation issues that are all surrounded that industry, um, it's very challenging for that community to keep up with innovation. I mean Frankly, the whole quantified self movement with sensors is we are developing new sensors and new data all the time and in an industry that has the burdens of um, regulation and litigation around it, it makes it really challenging for that community. Plus, I mean, like I said, even looking at the data and then you not doing something with it, you can then also be held liable. So that's, that's a challenge. Um, there's also the reverse. I was surprised that when companies do offer wellness incentives to employees, um, uh, there's a company down in Southern California who only 6% of the employees took advantage of, basically said, hey, if you move and use Fitbit to go ahead and track your steps and do so many steps, um, you'll get X number of dollars per month off of your health insurance. Only 6% of the employees took advantage of that. So I, I don't know, there's something broken where 
people don't have the motivation or not really being held accountable in a way that's working. Um, University of Colorado, with the MOOC program that we're doing for them, was delighted that they got 12% take, which to me sounds still pretty bad. I mean, I would like to get much higher than that. So there's a problem on the other end, too, of how do you get the consumer to look at and use this data in a way that they actually care about improving their health. Um, and, I, and I think there's more fundamental problems that we need to, you know, that, that's a different kind of a problem to address, but it's one that we should. For an innocuous example, uh, where standardization of data is just, just a challenge, is a company called Zio, that was a sleep improvement device. Right? Um, they had some early adoption, but, but doctors didn't know what to do with that data when the patient came. Right? And this is, this is just for sleep improvement. Right? Um, and ultimately, the, 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 the company just um, reverted from the hardware and went to a software and effectively got commoditized by all the 99 cent iPhone sleep quality apps that just use the sort of uh, sensors to understand what type of sleep quality you're getting. But even, even with Zio, the fact that you had this data that just couldn't be interpreted by, by the medical profession, or they didn't know what to do with it, you know, and ultimately they never accepted it. So um, a lot of things went wrong with that company, but, but again, that was, I think, a, a, a primary catalyst from their hardware approach. I'm kind and, of curious. I just wanted to follow up on that. Providers are doing trials and studies with these devices now. Um, I know UCSF has a healthy heart study and there, there are a number of other people doing that. There's this number that keeps coming up and I really hope that it's not this big anymore, but I always hear at health conferences that it takes 17 years for uh, to go from medical research to practicing in the clinic. And I really hope that that number is, can now be smaller because technology or whatever, I don't want to have to wait 17 years before Fitbits are part of uh, our, or quantified self is part of our medical um, world as well. But I think that it just takes time. In fact, their infrastructure, you know, I mean, like they most of them use Epics and all scripts and Cerner, you know. Some still use paper. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I'm, I'm talking about five years. years. <laughs> they <laughs> simply cannot actually, you know, collect or even <laughs> store data that comes from all these devices and, you know, you know the wristbands are, you know, good for me. There, there is another avenue that I see as um, maybe bridging the gap. When you go to your physical therapist, um, they're associated with a medical uh, institution but they don't have the same kind of constraints for their therapists that to, who will work with you. Uh, in the same way, I think that um, when it comes to um, nutritionists or fitness trainers, that um, there may be opportunities for the medical institutions to be able to leverage those resources as kind of um, outsourcing or intervention care that it has less constraints than maybe the doctor would have. Uh, I think you'll, you'll see more of that. Uh, with that, uh, we have to wrap up session one. Uh, please join me in thanking.